good afternoon. Bonjour, mesdames, messieurs. Bienvenue à cet événement Tête à Papineau. C'est la première de cette session d'hiver parlementaire. Comme on le dit si bien chez moi à Montréal, être une tête à Papineau, c'est être quelqu'un de très brillant et c'est le cas de notre invité aujourd'hui, Dr. Volker Gertz. Let us begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. Even though we are meeting on a virtual platform, we acknowledge the importance of the land that we call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous culture, peoples and their distinct cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations peoples that call this nation home. We pay respect to the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Partnership Group for Science and Engineering, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this Bakehead, Bacon and Eggheads event. Je suis Sydney Omelon, professeur en génie des matériaux à l'Université McGill et une des volontaires de Tête à Papineau. We work on behalf of the Partnership Group for Science and Engineering, which is a registered, not-for-profit, umbrella organization of 21 national science and engineering societies, representing more than 50,000 scientists and engineers. The Bacon and Egghead series is meant to offer parliamentarians and decision makers the opportunity to hear firsthand about the excellent research undertaken in Canada. Les conférenciers qui présentent sont des chercheurs et des innovateurs exceptionnels. Mais comme l'été Papineau, ces conférenciers doivent être aussi orateurs exceptionnels qui font le lien entre leur recherche et les besoins de la société. At the end of Dr. Gert's presentation, we will have a Q&A session. You are welcome to submit your questions through the chat function. Priority will be given to questions from members of parliament and senators. The Bacon and Egghead series gratefully acknowledges the support of the many organizations shown before the presentation. We are grateful to all of them, including Genome Canada and the University of Saskatchewan, who are supporting today's session. We also appreciate the support provided by our patrons, the Speaker of the House of Commons and the Speaker of the Senate. Thank you. I will now ask Dr. Rob Annan, President, President and CEO of Genome Canada, and Dr. Mike Say, CEO of Genome Prairie, to introduce our speaker. Excellent. Thank you, Sydney, uh, and thanks to the Partnership Group for Science and Engineering for, uh, for, for organizing this series. We at Genome Canada are very excited to be a sponsor for Bacon and Eggheads. Uh, we, it's a, such a valuable and important part of, uh, of the community, uh, and it's a great way to link kind of decision making with science to make sure that we're getting really great leadership, particularly in times like today. Uh, today's topic, obviously, is super important. Um, you know, COVID-19 has resulted in a mobilization of our resources, whether medical, economic, social, and scientific, uh, sort of unseen now in, in generations. Um, the rapid responses in uh, testing, surveillance, uh, vaccine development, therapeutics, and more have really helped us confront this, uh, this massive challenge. Uh, we at Genome Canada, uh, we've led a national genomics network called CanCagen, which has been dedicated to tracking the virus and its variants here in Canada and uh, contributing to tracking them around the world, and also to help us understand genetic linkages that inform uh, patient outcomes. This network uh, involves public health labs, research hospitals, academic labs, and others all working together to inform public health decisions and inform our response. Last week, the government announced a new integrated strategy for variants of concern that links this work with other important initiatives across the health system in testing, immunology, vaccine deployment, and more, resulting in a system that going forward will be more nimble, responsive, and, and better able to respond in real time. Because really, this is part of the lesson we've learned in all of this, is that the systems that we had really weren't ready to respond to something of this magnitude. Um, our people and the dedication they have to the cause right across the 
the ecosystem have risen to the challenge. Uh, but it's clear that we need more infrastructure at a scale and, and, and for it to be interconnected in a, in a much better way. So, so while we're responding to the crisis today and beginning to see that light at the end of the tunnel, we're all turning our minds to making sure that we capture these lessons and apply them that what we're building today is going to have value beyond just the current moment uh, and that will fill in the gaps that we've been feeling uh, all too acutely over, over these last months. So we at Genome Canada are turning our minds to this, working closely with six uh, regional genome centers supporting research and innovation in genomics and associated biosciences uh, to ensure that we have both the human and technical capacity to respond to future threats. So today uh, I'm super excited and we're all very lucky to hear from uh, Dr. Volker Gertz, whose Vito Intervac has really received due recognition as a key component of our pandemic readiness. I'm really looking forward to hearing Dr. Gertz's perspectives on how we can be better prepared. So to introduce him, I'm going to pass over to my colleague from Genome Prairie, Mike Say. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Sydney. And uh, I, I have the distinct honor of saying a few words about Vito and uh, about uh, Dr. Gertz uh, before we get to uh, the main event. So I will quickly get on with it. So Vito was originally established in 1975 at the University of Saskatchewan, and that Vito stands for Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization. It evolved from a small agriculture-focused research organization to a world-class research institute. It's dedicated to the development of vaccines for the protection of both human and animal health. There's about 160 interdisciplinary personnel. There's been over $200 million invested in containment infrastructure, and there's more than four decades of experience. Vito develops vaccines and technologies that protect health. Vito's COVAC-2 is a Canadian-made vaccine. It's currently in phase one of clinical trials in Halifax at the Canadian Centre for Vaccinology. In addition, work is currently underway to build a manufacturing facility that will produce up to 40 million doses annually. Vito is led by Dr. Volker Gertz, and his leadership team is looking forward towards the future, namely a proposed research centre that could play a valuable role in quickly responding to future pandemics. That's also the focus of this webinar. I won't steal Boker's thunder other than to say Vito has long been a jewel in the crown of the Canadian research community. It's up to us as citizens to ensure we resource this national asset appropriately. That's something we at Genome Prairie have taken very seriously through advancing and funding important research projects over the years. I'll say a few words about Dr. Gertz. Volker Gertz received, received a DVM or a doctorate in veterinary medicine in 1994 from Hanover University School and a German PhD equivalent from the Federal Research Institute for Animal Health, Island of Rhymes and Hanover Veterinary School in Germany in 1997. A postdoc fellowship funded by the German Research Council was spent from 1998 to 2000 here at Vito in the area of vaccine discovery and mucosal immunology. In 2002, Dr. Gertz joined Vito as a research scientist. He was appointed Associate Director of Research in 2007, and he became the Director and CEO in 2019. Of course, Dr. Dr. Gertz's research interests are in the area of developing vaccines for both humans and animals. I'll finish my comments by saying it has indeed been a long and challenging year for all of us, and we do have some ways to go yet but we should all be both proud and comforted that those that came before us saw fit to create and fund Vito these past 50 some years. And through that continued support, assembled hundreds of the brightest Canadian minds to build vaccines that will protect the future. I will now turn things over to Dr. Gertz. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Rob, Sydney, and uh, Mike. Um, just trying to share my screen and hope that that will work. And if one of you could just confirm that you can see it okay. Okay, well, thank you so much for the introduction. It's a really great honor to be here and talk to you this morning. I'd like to start out by saying a big thank you for the Partnership Group for Science and Engineering for inviting me and also to the team 
that has done an excellent job in organizing this and, and actually keeping me on schedule and sending slides in and all these things. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you for your interest this morning and in, in listening to my thoughts about how Canada can better prepare for the next emerging disease, whether it's a global pandemic or just a emerging disease, which not always has this uh, global impact. I'd like to talk to you this morning and, and quickly introduce uh, the work we're doing here at Vito at the University of Saskatchewan. Then I wanted to talk about um, emerging diseases and what we know about them and the impact they have and, and how we respond to them and uh, focus on vaccines as one of the, the ways of um, responding to these emerging diseases. And then lastly, provide some thoughts and um, really um, views, I guess, my own thoughts and views on how we can get the signs to help us to better prepare for the next emerging disease. So with that, I'd like to start out by just introducing you to our organization, the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization here at the University of Saskatchewan. We are a research center of the university. We have more than 45 years of expertise now in both human and animal health. And as you heard in the introduction, we started out as the veterinary infectious disease organization focusing on livestock problems. But quickly we recognize that what we see in animals is what we see in humans. And in fact, as I will point out later on, it's really this interface between humans and animals where these emerging new diseases originate from. And that's why it's so important when we work on solutions for them that we keep the bigger picture, the one health approach to this um, in our minds and, and really focus on this interface between humans and animals. As it was mentioned, we have about 150, 160 staff members here an annual budget of about $20 million. But as was pointed out in the introduction, we operate currently Canada's largest infrastructure for high containment um, pathogens. So these are um, pathogens that require what is called containment level three. And so you can see in this little infograph here, we have currently scientists from more than 25 different countries. Um, as is mentioned, more than $200 million worth in biocontainment infrastructure. We are ISO certified. We have more than 45 PhD level scientists um, that are working in here. Um, per year, we, con we conduct more than 150 infectious disease and vaccine studies and have developed and commercialized 10 vaccines now of which six were world's first. Um, just to mention that we do have an international board of directors who has representation from all the key stakeholders, sectors, including the pharma industry, the livestock industries, but also international governments and partner universities and research organizations from around the globe. Now, in the context of COVID-19, probably the most relevant is this, and this is the International Vaccine Center, we call it here. It's Canada's largest high containment lab. It allows us to work with these level three pathogens. And in fact, it is one of the largest and probably the most advanced facility in the world at the moment. It enables us to work with animals from very small, as you can see on the picture down there, um, bats here, brown bat on the hand, to very large, even bison, alpacas, pigs, cattle, and so on. And that allows us to use these large animals as a model for human diseases. And that's why, why this facility is so unique in the world in, in that we can house these large animals and many, many of them. We're currently, as you heard in the introduction, building a GMP facility that will go in here. Um, and, and so both the, the GMP manufacturing facility as as the whole research, um, 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 the whole facility overall is really the, the, a research hotel for researchers from all over Canada and around the world to come here and do their research. And they can either have us do the work for them, so pure contract as we have done mostly for COVID-19 right now, or they can send their own teams and work here, rent the space, work here for a while, move out and the next person moves in. And so this is funded through the Canada Foundation for Innovation and the government of Saskatchewan through the MSI program and the University of Saskatchewan as well. And it allows us to really um, enable researchers from all over Canada to use uh, containment level three space. Now, in regards to COVID-19, Vito was one of the leading organizations in the country to respond to the new challenge. We were the first in Canada to isolate the virus, and this was done with our, in collaboration with our colleagues at the Sunnybrook Health Center and also at the National Microbiology Lab at the Public Health Agency of Canada in Winnipeg. 
We were the first in Canada to have an animal model established, and we were now the first university lab in Canada to have a vaccine candidate already in clinical trials. But probably uh, more relevant in the context of this talk is really to say that Vito has become one of the go-to places in Canada for COVID-19 research. And we now have over the last year worked with more than 80 different companies, half of them Canadian, on, on doing what I just described before, um, working on their vac vaccines, working on their drugs and working on their therapeutics by using our high containment infrastructure here. Um, this was supported financially by the federal government, but also by the provincial government, which is important to point out. And you can see here, we received $23 million last year to develop a Made in Canada vaccine. Uh, we received $11.3 million through the MSI program through the Canada Foundation for Innovation to enhance our capacity. And uh, we received $12 million, which was the second part of the funding for our vaccine manufacturing facility, which is currently underway. The province of Saskatchewan stepped up and they gave us $4.2 million both for the, um, for the research on the vaccine, but also in support of our vaccine manufacturing facility. And so this funding allowed us then to quickly hire more people and, and allocate resources. And now we have a very large team, as you can see here, of dedicated researchers that are specifically are working on COVID-19 COVID right now. They do this in shifts. They work very long days, weekends, and so on. And it's been quite the endeavor over the last year. And I'd like to thank all of them at this point for all the dedication and effort they have put into, into this COVID-19 work um, over the last year. In addition to that, we have reached out to many, many partners across the country. We have collaborations, as you can see here, with the government, um, with the public health agency, with CFIA and Alberta Health Services, and worked with many, many different universities in Canada, plus all these um, companies that I listed before. And as you can see on the right side, um, we, we even seconded researchers from other universities to come to Vito um, for years um, and bring their groups with them and do research on COVID-19 here at Vito using um, our facilities. And here's uh, just an overview of the contract research. So as I mentioned, more than 80 companies that we have worked with, um, including large foundations like the Gates Foundation and others, about half of them are roughly Canadian, half of them international. And this is really possible because Vito has a dedicated contract research group that has dedicated and designated project managers. We're ISO certified. And so we're very familiar with the process of, of working with biotech and pharma and, um, and really meeting their needs in terms of development and so on. Now, moving on, when we talk about emerging infectious diseases, obviously we don't really need an introduction. We all live through a pandemic right now, but an emerging infectious disease is really a disease that has appeared in a population for the first time or that may have existed previously, but is now rapidly increasing in incidence or geographic range. And this is a def definition by the World Health Organization who already in 2018, so years ago, identified disease X as one of the 10 most important threats to global health. And so if we think about it, some of the recent examples, so of course there was SARS-1, there was Zika, there was MERS, there was the so-called swine flu or the so-called pandemic flu, and now there is SARS-CoV-2. But then we also have seen outbreaks of measles in Canada, mumps, pertussis, even an increased incidence of streptococcus and so on. So many, many diseases just over the last decade. And we think actually that every, every uh, year there is about three new diseases that emerge and every second or third year there is a larger event that um, we should be concerned about. The other important thing though to mention is while we're focusing of course on COVID-19 right now and human aspects, emerging diseases also affect animals. And they are a major threat to our Canadian livestock industries. In fact, many of these diseases, while they're affecting animals, also then jump into humans. And so they're zoonotic in nature. More than 70% of all emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic in nature, meaning they jump from one species into the other, so from animals into humans, or they may jump from humans into animals as we had seen with the swine flu. And, and you see this news clip on the right side. So while all of us are focusing on COVID-19 in our daily lives and hoping for our lives to return to somewhat normalcy in the near future, just last year, so a few months ago, 
Europe's largest pork producer, Germany, um, had its first case of African swine fever, a deadly disease of pigs that has been circulating over the last few years in, in Asia, mainly in China, in Thailand, Korea, and so on, Vietnam. But it's a, it's a huge threat to the Canadian industry. And, and the Canadian pork industry has been on high alert for many, many years now. The problem with this disease is that we don't have vaccines for it and that it's a huge issue for our trade with other countries. Canada's pork industry is an export industry. More than 60, almost 70% of our products are going to other countries. Having the disease here will immediately close the borders and, and, and take away the opportunity to trade with other countries. And so this is economically, of course, a huge issue. We estimate the impact for North America alone would be in the range of 23 to $25 billion. And there is others. If you think about BSE, if you think about the so-called bird flu, the avian influenza, another coronavirus of pigs, which made its way into Canada in 2014. Vito, by the way, was the, one, the first Canadian organization who had a vaccine developed for it. And then most recently, we saw cases of bovine tuberculosis in southern Saskatchewan and Alberta. So huge risks um, to our animal industry as well. Now, obviously, we don't need to talk much about the economic impact. We all know that right now we are all suffering greatly from the current pandemic. And you can see here the real GDP growth for these countries listed. This is data that was just um, published by the BBC um, just in January this year. And you can see, of course, the impact on many of these countries, the impact on the stock exchange when these um, pandemics start and how, how really the drops are, are significant. Um, the same, of course, with unemployment. Um, these are numbers comparing 2019 and 2020, and we can see shifts in, in a higher in, in unemployment as a result of the pandemics, and of course, a drop in ads for new job postings in many, many countries around the world. And of course, we all know global travel essentially has come to stand still. Um, that, of course, affects also tourism, and you can see here how shortly after the, the um, W announced the, the outbreak, how the flights dropped essentially, and how now the, the global tourism industry is crumbling around the world. So these um, emerging infectious diseases can economically have a huge impact, and it is important that we prepare for them and respond, and respond in a very timely fashion to them. So how do we respond to these emerging infectious diseases? What elements are involved? And of course, I'm a scientist, so I'm going to give you my view as a researcher, how science is involved in this. But of course, there's many, many other aspects of society that are involved in responding to, to these emerging infectious diseases, which are not part of my talk this morning. So you can see here these three gears, these three wheels, and how they really have to work together to, to effectively respond. And so starting on the right side is really where science comes into play, research and also development. And so you can see there is a long list of things, and then this is of course a busy slide, but what it really talks about is the immediate task for research is the global coordination and the collaboration. You need to immediately reach out to other countries and, and, and talk to the scientists over there. The WHO has very effectively done this. There's weekly meetings that we attended as part of these expert groups where we immediately in real lifetime, um, in real time exchange on data and so on and report results. While you have to isolate the pathogen, as, as I showed, Vito was the one who isolated in Canada COVID-19 first. You have to immediately start developing diagnostics tests and reagents. You have to understand um, what the disease looks like and what it does, how it transmits. You have to have animal models that allow you then to, to address um, those questions. How can we um, develop vaccines? Do these vaccines work and so on? You have to address questions about the host reservoirs. Who is affected? Is it just humans? Is it also affecting our animals? Is it affecting wildlife species? Is it affecting our livestock species? What are the correlates of the immunity? What, what do we need to do to get a vaccine and make it effective? How long does protection last? What does protection look like? And then of course, what happens if the virus evolves as we see right now, all these new variants coming, how can we address that? So science, as you can see, research has lots and lots and lots of questions that need to be addressed right up front in the presentation. 
On the development side, of course, you can see immediately we need to start developing vaccines, antivirals, therapeutics, and so on. And it requires a large coordination around the world. Um, and it needs to also address things like specific target groups, which age groups, what, what ethnicity, what gender, and so on. So you can see that R&D plays a very, very, very important role in helping us to make the right decisions, which are then um, suggested by the public health system who focuses on, on surveillance, on diagnostics, on contract tracing, on modeling, on prevention, and then also setting up mass campaigns. And then of course our decisions makers who then take this information and need to make the decisions on and develop new policies on how we monitor um, the situation, how we go into lockdowns, shutdowns, all these things. And then of course we need to look at procurement of vaccines, drugs, drugs, excuse me, drugs and so on, as well as communication. So I wanted to focus in my talk on, on, on the response to COVID-19 and use um, vaccines as an example to that and quickly go over this, although many of you have heard this many, many times before. So in the interest of time, I'm trying to speed up here a little bit. Um, so this is really a, a schematic of the virus and we all have heard of the spike protein, which is this protein on the surface of the virus that the virus uses to attach to the cell. And um, this is shown here in the next slide, you can see here viral, these are labeled virus particles that are trying to make the way to the surface of the cell to then get into the cell. So here's the cell that you can see and the virus on the outside trying to get in. And the virus does this by attaching to a receptor on the surface of the cell using the spike lipoprotein as the, the um, attachment protein that is involved in it. And so the strategy of course, for many of our vaccines is to, to block, to neutralize this attachment here. And we do this by inducing high levels of antibodies. We call them neutralizing antibodies because they effectively block the attachment of the virus to the cell. On the other hand, we also want specific immune cells called uh, T cells to be effective because we at the same time then want to kill infected cells. So take away what normally happens during an infection where the virus gets in, takes over the cell machinery, and then makes thousands and thousands of copies of itself, which eventually leave the cell and then get into other cells. And so this is where T cells come into play and in that we hope that we kill these infected cells before the virus can make many, many of its copies. Now this is happening in your nasal mucosa. And so these are the cells that I just showed you here. Here would be the surface of it. So there's receptor as on the surface here. Virus will be coming in through the airways, makes its way to the cell surface and then gets in and from here it's being spread throughout the body. So the whole idea is that we want a good response right here, preventing the virus from getting into these cells and then also in the body um, um, blocking the virus from infecting other cells. And so that's why most vaccines are focusing on the spike protein. There is um, two technologies, live virus and inactivated vaccines. They are using the whole virus, either as a live virus, which we don't have in North America at the moment, China is working on one of those, or we just take the whole virus and inactivate it and then use it as a vaccine. Those two approaches are not very popular. Not many companies are working on that. As you know, more companies are working on what we call subunit vaccines. So they're just focusing on the spike protein as the, the target for the vaccines. And they do this either by focusing on the genetic um, instruction on the manual, if you want, um, which is what our RNA and DNA vaccines are. So they're focusing on the region that encodes for the protein. They deliver the protein and the, the code um, with an, a vector, an adenovirus vector, for example, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Or we can use what Vito is doing or Novavax is doing, for example, using the protein as a subunit itself. And so then normally um, this process, of course, vaccine development takes many, many years and it's outlined here to you. There is this initial preclinical phase, um, which in, in starts out with a lab phase. Then there is an animal phase in which you are in animals proof of con demonstrate proof of concept. And then you go into these clinical trials and all of us are now experts on these trials as we have heard it in the news so many times. 
Um, phase one is really focusing on the safety of the vaccine. Phase two is focusing on safety and also how well does the vaccine work. And phase three then is really testing the vaccine in, in large uh, cohorts out there. And so what we can see, of course, globally, we all know this, many of these um, um, current developers are already in phase three, uh, phase three trials and have received emergency authorization. Within Canada, we have a number of companies that are already in clinical trials, including ourselves here in Medicago, who is currently the front runner, already um, about to start their phase three trials. Now, when we talk about costs, of course, this is not cheap to develop a vaccine. In fact, in the old traditional way, it was um, essentially for a human vaccine estimates between 500 or $800 million and even a billion dollars to, to develop vaccines. Now, I think these are numbers here that are um, focused on emerging infectious diseases, but you can see even for each of these individual steps to get a vaccine as quickly to the market as possible require large investments as shown here. This is the most direct way if you are now looking into specific age groups and in, in, in children, into pregnant women, and all of these things, you can multiply many of these um, um, numbers here by, by having to do more clinical trials. So it's a very, very large and very significant undertaking on how we make vaccines for them. Here's our own vaccine. And as was mentioned, um, we are now in phase um, one to two trials. We started our design in January. Within four and a half weeks, we had a vaccine ready that could go into animals, demonstrated in March and in ferrets already that the vaccine was working. And then we had to unfortunately go outside of the organization to manufacture a vaccine because our own manufacturing facility was not available at the time. And that's probably what has taken us the longest. If you look at our timeline here, we started out very quick. In fact, we were one of the, the fastest in the world with having a vaccine in animals. But then where, where it took us a lot of time is that we had to go and get other companies to do the manufacturing for us. And this is something I'm gonna talk about in, in um, you know, how we can better prepare and what infrastructure we need to have in place and better responding to it. So we're currently building a manufacturing facility here at Vito, which is um, construction will be completed in 2021. It may look like something like this. These are, of course, pictures that I took from the internet. This is not exactly how it looks. But what it, what it shows you is how GMP facilities, good manufacturing practice facilities look these days. They're essentially um, very, 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 very clean rooms that have these stainless steel bioreactors in them. And then what is used, what is called single use. So bags in them in which essentially you put your vaccine in there and um, you run it for four weeks or whatever time it takes to, to um, run this particular vaccine. You can then harvest the, the soup from out of these bags, purify the vaccine, and essentially put it in, in glass slides to full finish. That is, of course, a very, very simplified way of um, speaking about this highly complicated process. But what we are building here at Vito is a facility that will allow us to do both human and animal vaccines, and more importantly, will allow us to to manufacture different vaccine technologies, so both viral as well as bacterial vaccines, um, and, and thus we'll be able to really um, help Canada in making um, vaccines in the future. We hope that our first production runs can start in 2022. You can see construction is underway. You can see that this is all the piping and so on is now being tied into our containment facility, which is shown here which again makes this facility very unique in the world in that it is actually tied in into our level three containment. But really then the question is how can science help us to be better prepared for the next emerging disease? And so here is um, four points, nothing new. All of this is, um, is really what we have learned many, many times over the last decade or so. Um, you know, we need to improve and invest money into surveillance. Um, we have now really made significant advances in the area of genomics and omics in general. Uh, we can now go and screen, surveil do surveillance in specific populations. We can look in, in sewage, in wildlife, in domestic species, anywhere, and look for these pathogens where they are and get a status or, or a sense of um, how far they have spread already. 
um, important is that we need to have large data platforms and, and these are now becoming available for rapid exchange of this information to, to be globally connected and globally tied in. The next thing is really prediction. And this is, I think, in my mind, where science has probably the advanced the most over the last decade or so. We have now the ability to really understand the structure of these pathogens by using structural biology. Uh, we, we understand how these viruses or these bacteria look, what, what configuration they take and how they interact with the host. And, and so by this, we can actually now predict what the next pathogen might look like. And we can, we can model that if you want, simulate it in the lab using uh, our con computers and using bioinformatics and, and the omics sciences to, to really predict what the next disease might be. And then with that information, we can start on working preventing for the next disease. And so I think we all learning right now, seeing how successful the RNA vaccine technologies are, that it is very, very important for us to have platform technologies that allow rapid deployment, both for vaccines, for drugs, as well as therapeutics. And ideally those platforms could be even pre-approved by the regulators so that all you have to do when a new disease emerges you pop in that sequence that comes from the pathogen, everything else is already being pre-approved and you're ready to launch. Now the target right now, the global target just um, by CEPI and WHO um, announced just last week is now down to 100 days following the um, an, an outbreak. Within 100 days, we wanna have vaccines um, that can go into clinical testing. And of course, science cannot be done in isolation. We need to continue to collaborate and we need to have better coordination, better networks of how these scientists can work together to, to anticipate, prepare, and, and be ready for the next emerging disease. And so this is in my mind where, where as a country, we really need to think about um, how do we build, put the infrastructure in place that allows us to effectively respond. And so in my personal mind, what we need is specific infrastructure that is, that is focused on work on emerging infectious diseases. Research center, and I call them for simplicity now, pandemic centers, research centers that are equipped with a proper infrastructure. So that means a high containment lab, in-house GMP manufacturing, as well as animal housing and so on. They have scientists around the um, global experts from around the world and, and, and trained and ready to go and the expertise to rapidly respond. So as I mentioned, they have to have in-house high containment facility, in-house manufacturing, the ability to work with exotic species from which these diseases emerge. They have to be tied in into these large networks and large data platforms and focus on developing platform technologies that, it, that can be then rapidly deployed when a next disease emerge. Now to get that in place, of course, we need to invest in the infrastructure but we also need to think about strategically recruiting the best in the world through direct recruitment, through fellowship programs and so on. But we also need to start um, building the proper capacity in, in Canada to train people in working in high containment facilities, working in level three and even level four laboratories. These organizations, these centers need to partner with national and global pharma and biotech. As I mentioned, we work with more than 80 different companies they require a, a quick turnaround time, a, a, a immediate response to their needs and so on. And so it's important that these centers are tied in well into the farm. And lastly, I think it is very important for us as a country to provide long-term operating funding to these. And really what we should, all should think about is, are these, these, um, these fire halls, if you want. If you want firefighters, if you want trained scientists to be ready to be used when an emergency happens, we need to have the fire departments in place. We cannot start when a fire breaks out, looking for people, recruiting them and training them. And so this is why I think it is so important um, to have this in place. So how do we get there? Well, this is looking at our gross domestic spending on R&D. And unfortunately we, we're seeing that Canada over the last um, few years maybe has fallen back a little bit behind some of our um, um, comparative countries around the world in terms of spending. Um, and so this is, I think, in my mind, where we need to invest into Canada's R&D sector by both building infrastructure, um, promoting discovery type research, 
but also looking at really developing um, and commercializing products and so on. And as you can see down here, this is really where I think we also need to think about special funding for emerging, um, for emerging infectious diseases for these pandemic centers. And so Canada had a very response. I know I'm running out of time here. Canada had a very response very fast response to COVID-19. This was a CHR called and call in partnership with many, many organizations. Um, over 200 projects got funded. The review process was, was super fast, two weeks. Um, and, and of course, I said and other organizations have provided large amounts of money, but, but really what we did is we reacted to COVID-19. And, and this is my whole point of this. We need to be proactive rather than reactive. We need to now think about how do we best invest into emerging infectious disease research so that we are then ready to launch our efforts when the new disease emerges. And so this is again showing here, expanding the infrastructure, operating funding, scientific capacity, rapid response networks. And then also very important, have separate calls for proposals so that we can actually work and practice, practice, practice. Containment level three and containment level four research is very, very expensive. And it's important that we practice this. And so this is my last slide here showing where I see the field is going, where science is taking us. So from normally waiting for an outbreak of a disease and then traditionally it would have taken us almost 10 years to make a vaccine. Well, now we think we can do it in the future in less than two years. But even then, it still accounts for, for trillions in losses and, of course, millions of lost lives. So the question is really, why do we have to wait until a new disease emerges? Why can't we predict what it is and make vaccines in anticipation and have them ready so that a plane could take off from Geneva with 10 million doses on board and you could immediately start vaccinating people in the immediate surrounding? And so this is shown here. Um, I, as I mentioned, I believe that structural science, bioinformatics have advanced so much that we are now in a situation where we can predict what the next pathogen might look like. We can then almost in the lab simulate what might happen in nature by, by having these um, jump to species barriers and then have a vaccine for the next disease available. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge, of course, all the great support we've received over the last year, both from the federal government as well as the, the uh, government of Saskatchewan, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, and many, many private funders. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm sorry that I went two minutes over time here. And uh... now I am thrilled to invite the Honorable Alexandra Mendez, Assistant Deputy Speaker and Deputy Chair of Committees of the Whole, to express our sincere thanks to Dr. Garrett. I should, I should be used to this by now, but I'm sorry, <laughs> just the unmuting and turning on the video. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Gertz, absolutely a fascinating presentation. You left me with more questions than <laughs> I, would, I would spend, I think, the next hour asking questions. Um, I'm very impressed by the work that is being done at Vido, and um, I, I'm definitely going to share this with my uh, parliamentar parliamentarian colleagues. Um, J'aimerais aussi remercier le partenariat, um, le partenariat en faveur des sciences et de la technologie pour uh, cette excellente série de, de, de conférences qui, uh, qui nous informe et qui nous permet de guider les politiques que le Canada, dont le Canada aura besoin uh, pour se préparer dans le futur. I think that's more than anything what we need to take from this conference, Dr. Gertz. It's, it, it's Dr. I'm sorry, Dr. Gertz. It's to absolutely be prepared. Uh, Canada cannot allow itself to fall behind again, uh, and I think uh, that most definitely is the biggest lesson I take from this. Thank you again so much for the opportunity. Um, I really learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming today. Merci d'être venu. We hope you enjoyed today's session. We also hope that you will complete the short survey that will appear in your browser at the end of this session to improve our future events. Our next egghead will present their work on land reclamation in the energy sector. On March 25th, we are excited to host Dr. Nath, who is a professor and associate dean in the Faculty of Agricultural Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Alberta. For information about future bacon and egghead events, 
please follow us on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Merci d'avoir participé à cet événement grandiose.